Hello, my name is Derek Atkins, and this is Theology 2. This today's lecture is on the constitutional nature of human beings. One of the great philosophical and theological debates of the last 400 years is the mind body debate. Um, this debate in its simplest form asks the question, what is the relationship between the mind and the body? Now, if this sounds like an esoteric debate, that has nothing to do with the real world, nothing could be farther from the truth. A lot hangs on this, the mind-body debate, because this debate is really asking whether we're only physical creatures who are made up of only atoms, chemicals, and neurons, or whether we're living spirits. If we're only physical creatures as physical philosophical materialists claim, then when we die, that's simply the end of the story. Th th that's all, folks. But if we are living spirits, then this means that death is not the end of the story. Today's lesson does not get into the question of what happens to us after we die, but it does provide an important foundation for the whole discussion about what happens to us after we die. So in Christian theology, there are three basic views of the nature of humanity. There is the monist view, the dichotomous view, and the trichotomous view. So what we're going to do in this video lecture is we are going to look at the biblical basis for each of these views. We will describe what each view is, and we will look at the critique of the, each of these views. So that's what we'll be doing in today's video lecture. The first view I want to talk about is the trichotomous view. So the trichotomous view says that human beings are made up of three different parts, the body, the mind, and the spirit. Now, there is those who believe the, in the trichotomous view argue that there are some verses that give us a biblical basis for the trichotomous view. The first of these is 1 Thessalonians 5.23. And part of 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, we find mention of spirit, soul, and body, three different parts. Then we have Hebrews 4.12, which says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. So here again, and we have a verse that described that um, described human beings as consisting of three different parts, soul and spirit, and then body. Uh, that phrase joints and marrow refers to the human body. So these are verses that trichotomists use to support their view. Now, there are some definitions that trichotomists use in referring to these different parts of human beings. The first is the body. And this is the material or physical part of human beings. But then trichotomists distinguish between souls and spirits. 
So they would say that our soul is the animal aspect which relates to other creatures and includes our intellect, our emotions, our will, and our self-consciousness. Um, this, this comes from the um, Latin word animus, actually Greek word animus, because Aristotle called this kind of soul animus, from which we get the English word animal and animus. And then trichotomists argued that um, the spirit is separate from the soul. And they say that the spirit is the spiritual part of human beings that relates to God and enables us to be aware of God. So they argue that there are three different parts to human being, body, soul, and spirit. But there is a problem with the trichotomist view. And the problem is that linguistically and semantically, the word soul and spirit are used interchangeably in the Bible. Um, this is much like how in everyday English, the words gift and present are used almost interchangeably. For example, if I talk about Christmas, we talk about giving people Christmas presents, or we talk about receiving Christmas gifts. So this is an example of how the words gifts and presents are used interchangeably in English. And the problem with the trichotomist view is that in many places in the Bible, the words soul and spirit are also used interchangeably. For example, in, in Genesis 41.8, we read how Pharaoh's mind was troubled. And this is, this is found in the New International Version, the NIV. It says that Pharaoh's mind was troubled. But when you look at the King James Version and some other translations of the Bible, it says that Pharaoh's spirit was troubled. So we, we see these words, soul and spirit, and sometimes mind, being used interchangeably throughout the Bible. Now, um, verses like 1 Thessalonians 5.23 are probably better understood as colloquial expressions similar to those found in Mark 12.30, where Jesus calls us to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, you know, when Jesus tells us to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, the emphasis is on totality. In other words, the emphasis is on us loving God with every aspect of our being. We are to love God with all that we are. And so um, verses like um, Mark 12, 30, or 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 5, 23, are not intended to teach us about the constitutional nature of human beings, but rather they are calling us to love God with all of who we are. Um, by way of analogy, I might say something like, give it all you've got. Now, when I say give it all you've got, what I don't mean is that you should give away everything you possess. What I do mean is that you should try your hardest to accomplish whatever goal or feat you are trying to achieve. So that's the trichotomous view of human nature. Let's look at the dichotomous view of human nature. According to the dichotomous view, human nature is divided into two basic parts, the material and the immaterial. So dichotomous would say that humans have a material part and an immaterial part. Um, dichotomous point to several verses in the Bible to support their view. Um, 
One of these is Genesis 2, 7, which says the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. So here we see the physical component, dust, and then we see the spiritual component, which is energized or um, created by that breath of life that God breathed into Adam's nostrils. And then man became a living being. So in Genesis 2, 7, we see both the material and immaterial nature of humans. Then there's Matthew 10, 28, in which Jesus says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So in Matthew 10, 28, we have Jesus himself talking about our souls and our bodies um, as two separate parts of the whole person. Now, um, we do have a definition that is used to help us understand the dichotomous view. And that definition is that the human soul or spirit is a spiritual or immaterial entity. This is the part of the person that persists or survives after death. So that's the dichotomous view. And we will look at some critiques of the dichotomous view later in this lecture. Let's now move on to look at the monist view. The monist view says that humanity is made up of only one part, that is the material part. And the material part is that part that is made up of matter and energy. And the monist would argue that the material part that makes us up are arranged in various levels of complexity. Thus, we are like animals, but monists would, Christian monists would argue that we can still relate to God. They would go on to say that the higher capacities like self-awareness and self-determination are emergent properties which are inherent in the nature of matter as it becomes increasingly complex. And um, is there any biblical basis for this? This is the question you might be wondering. Well, monists, Christian monists, argued that there is biblical basis for the monist view. For example, they, they point to passages in the Bible where animals are spoken of as living souls. And they would argue that when the Bible talks about animals as being living souls, that that is, that is essentially a unitary view of creatures, that creatures are uh, made up of a single property, material, the, the physical property, and that that also applies to humans. Um, Monists also argue that their view is also based on the concept of physical resurrection, okay? So they would argue that because the Bible teaches resurrection, phys a physical resurrection, that is evidence that we are just one, uh, made up of one substance, the physical substance. They go on to say that, um, monism in the Bible is also supported by a view that they call soul sleep. Now, we're not, we're not going to get too much into the intermediate state in this lecture, but to understand monism, we do need to understand their view of the intermediate state. They believe that there is no intermediate state, that when we die, instead of going to be with the Lord, 
we simply go into a period of soul sleep. That is our bodies and our soul both go to sleep. And that um, when we wake up, we wake up at the moment of, re of the resurrection. And so um, they used the verse in Philippians 1.23 to um, support this view. And Philippians 1.23 says, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. And so Monus um, interpret Philippians 1.23 as meaning when we die, we do not have an intermediate state, but instead, once we die, we have soul sleep, and then when we wake up, we wake up immediately in the presence of the Lord at the resurrection. Okay, now, so the monist view denies that there is an intermediate state, and it also appears to be a compromise with the secular materialist view of human being. Because recall, you may remember that earlier I said that um, monists believe that our consciousness and our, our, our um, higher faculties are emergent properties that, that is, they emerge as, um, as animals reach higher and higher levels of complexity. And this, as you may realize, sounds very similar to the secular theory of natural evolution or biological evolution, which argues that humans are simply more complex forms of life and that we evolved from simpler forms of life. So this is why some would say that the monist view is actually a compromise with the secular view of evolution. Okay. Now, after looking at these three views, how are we to understand human nature? Well, we can, we can, I think that one of the better ways to understand human nature is to um, view human nature as being multifaceted. You know, just like a diamond has many different facets and many different sides to it, so do human beings. And so the multifaceted view affirms that there are many terms used in the Bible to describe humanity's material and immaterial nature. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to look at some of these terms that the Bible uses to describe our material nature and some of the terms that the Bible uses to describe our immaterial nature. So let's look at some of the words that the Bible uses to describe our material nature. Probably the first word that the Bible uses to describe our material nature is the word dust. And we saw this in Genesis 2, 7, where it says, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. And so, um, the Hebrew word that is used here is hapar, and this word, this describes what Adam is created from by God. Now, Paul in the New Testament refers to this passage, Genesis 2-7, and he uses the term earth, guh, and earthy, choikos. And he uses these two terms to describe um, humans in contrast to the heavenly body that we will receive at the coming of Christ. In other words, Paul uses this term dust or earth or earthy to describe our earthly bodies in contrast to the heavenly bodies that we will receive at the coming of Christ. Another word that the Bible uses to describe our 
material nature is the word flesh. Now, what the Hebrew word that is used for flesh is basar, and the Greek word is sarx. Um, in your, if you are, have taken Greek, you may have come across this Greek word sarx before. Paul uses the word sarx in a negative spiritual sense, as well as in a more physical and literal sense. The writer of Hebrews referred to humans as those with flesh and blood, and the writer of Hebrews notes that Jesus partook of the same, and that's according to the NASB. So flesh is another word that the Bible uses to describe our material selves. Another word that the Bible uses to describe our material nature is the word body. And the Greek word that is used for body is soma. Now, uh, you may have heard the word psychosomatic. Uh, that, and that the somatic in that word comes from the Greek word soma or body. And the Colossian passage that is noted here um, notes that Jesus was the physical embodiment of God. So body is another word that the Bible uses to describe our physical or material nature. Another, yet another word that the Bible uses to describe our material nature is the word members. And uh, we see this in Romans 6.13. The Greek word that is used for members is malay, and it usually refers to specific parts of the physical body, such as our arm, our leg, our hands, etc. But these parts are referred to generally and not specifically. Um, in other words, the I, I think in other words, the idea here is that all the parts of the body work together to make up the whole person. And so this is this is how this word members is used in the New Testament. Now there are in fact numerous terms um, and other specific ways that the biblical writers refer to the physical aspect of human beings. But these parts are referred, um, but we do not have enough time or space to explore these other words here. So let's look at some words that the Bible uses to describe our immaterial nature. The first word I want to mention is the word heart. Now, the Greek word that is used for heart in the New Testament is the word cardia. And this is where we get the word cardiologist. Um, a cardiologist is a doctor who specializes in taking care of people's hearts. Um, now, when the Bible uses the word heart, the Bible is using that word figuratively, and the Bible is not referring to the actual organ that pumps blood in our body, but rather the Bible is referring to our heart as the immaterial center of feeling and emotion. Another word that the Bible uses to describe our immaterial selves is the word conscience. Now, the Greek word for conscious is synodesis, and this refers to our moral sensibility, our sense of right and wrong. Then we have the word mind. Um, now, the Greek word mind for mind is nous, N-O-U-S, and again, just like when the Bible talks about the heart, when the Bible uses the word mind, it is not referring to the brain as an organ, but rather to the mind as, a, as the seat of 
thinking. So just as the word heart is used in a figurative way, so is the word mind in the New Testament used in a figurative way. Then there is the word will. And um, the Greek word for will is thelema. Um, this Greek word thelema refers to the center of our conscious decisions and choices. So it is with the will that we make um, many different decisions. Sometimes we make small decisions and sometimes we make big decisions. But all of these decisions are, when we make all of any of these decisions, we are exercising our will, which is found in the Greek word thelema. And um, again, the new, just as with material terms, the Bible uses many other terms to describe our immaterial nature. And once again, we do not have enough time or space to explore all of these words. But what I do want you to see is that when it comes to material terms and immaterial terms, the Bible uses a wide variety of words and terms to describe both our immaterial nature and our material nature. So what is what can we say about the relationship between our material and our immaterial aspects? Well, one of the ways we can describe the relationship between our material and immaterial aspects is this phrase, conditional unity. And this is a phrase that um, is used by the theologian Miller J. Erickson. And uh, he coined this term, and in some ways, this term may be the best explanation of what we are getting at with respect to the relationship between both aspects of human nature. Um, we are created for embodiment, but our souls can be separated from our bodies and retain our identity in the process. Nevertheless, we are made for embodiment, and in the new heaven and in the new earth, we will be fitted with bodies that are appropriate for that future existence. Now, here is how Erickson describes this idea of conditional unity. So I'm going to read um, an extended passage. He says, the full range of biblical data can, be, can best be accommodated by the view that we will term conditional unity. According to this view, the normal state of a human is as an embodied unitary being. In scripture, humans are not urged to flee or escape from the body as if it were somehow inherently evil. This monistic condition can, however, be broken down, and at death it is, so that the immaterial aspect lives on even as the material decomposes. At the resurrection, however, there will be a return to a bodily condition the person will assume a body that has some point of continuity with the old body, but is also a new or reconstituted or spiritual body. So that is how Miller Erickson described conditional unity. So, um, so where does now? we still need to discuss one more question. And that is, where does the soul or human spirit come from? And there are several theories in, among Christian theologians about where our souls come from. 
The first one, the first theory is the pre-existence theory, which says that the soul is immortal and pre-exists before it becomes embodied. Um, this, now, this idea lends itself to ideas of reincarnation and the transmigration of the soul. Um, it also removes our dependence upon God because um, this pre, the three existence theory does not do justice to the scriptural descriptions of our soul and suggests that the soul is an independent is has an independent and parallel experience to God. And so it removes our dependence upon God. So these are a couple of reasons, problems with the pre-existence theory. It removes our dependence on God and it lends itself to ideas of reincarnation and transmigration of the soul. Uh, the second theory about where our soul comes from is the creation theory. Um, this is also sometimes known as the direct creationist view. And um, many theologians who hold this view believe that God directly creates each person's soul at the moment of human conception. Um, and this fits in with the uh, view that at the moment of conception, that that egg and that sperm have united and to produce a human being. So it fits with this idea that people are humans from the very moment of conception. Now, um, the creationist theory or direct creationist theory has a problem because it must address the problem of how sin enters the human race if God creates each one of us as good. So in other words, if God is creating human souls directly at the moment of conception, then how does sin enter the human race? Okay, so that is the problem with the uh, direct creationist theory of where our souls come from. Then there is the tradition theory. And the tradition theory um, says that the soulish aspect of humans is passed from generation to generation through conception, through the normal process of conception and procreation. Um, and the idea is that, uh, is that our souls are passed from generate from parent to children. You know, that, that that's where our human nature comes from. Our human nature comes from our parents, including our souls. And um, one, one biblical verse that is used to support this view is Psalm 51.5, where uh, King David wrote, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Um, and then it, this theory also seemed to fit um, Genesis 5 2, where, um, where it describes how Adam slept with Eve and then Eve gave birth to Seth. And Genesis 5 2 speaks of how. Um, the children of Adam and Eve were in the image of Adam. So the idea there is that just as Adam was created in the image of God, so were Adam's children in the image of Adam. Um, now, the tradition theory seems to, do, to best account for the notion of soul and image as in Adam's reproduction and in the whole general biblical description of human nature. So what can we say about all of this? 
Well, what we can say is that we are created by God, body and soul, to image him in creation and to see that we are conformed to the image of Christ, body and soul. This is why Paul can say that our, that our purchase of redemption includes our whole being and that we must, are therefore to glorify God in our bodies as well as our spirit, because this is exactly what Paul, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6.20, you were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your body. So God created us both body and soul, and as believers, we are called to glorify him in both body and soul. So we, so in our class session, we will discuss these ideas um, further, and I want you to, to encourage you to come to class with any questions you might have about any of these things that we've talked about in this lecture. Um, also come with any comments you might want to make. So thank you um, for listening to this lecture, and I enjoy seeing you in class and talking about this with you.